um, Jody was my dissertation chair. So um, I started working, you know, I, I went to Heller in part because I was really interested in Jody's work and um, had actually um, prior to graduate school had done a little bit of work um, in at BU School of Public Health and in the Boston VA system with some of the folks at, I think it's now choir or was choir and now something else, but uh, Marty Charns and, and Carol Van Dusen Lucas, and they were sort of very familiar with her work. So that's sort of how this, how it all, how that work started. But um, I, you know, worked as a, and I started working on that systematic review. I mean, I was probably only in my second or third year of my grad program. And it was one of those things where I think people kept asking her if there was like a single source for all of the empirical, you know, like a, a single thing that they could cite instead of pulling all of the citations um, related to RC. And um, and so it, it started off as like a, you know, just kind of a, I don't know, we started off trying to do it and then it just, it kind of kept evolving and growing and changing. And then the literature kept growing um, kind of, more and more quickly over the course of the time that we were doing it. Um, and so then it's taken a while to kind of, it took a while to get through it. But, um, and then the, you know, the other, and then I ended up doing my dissertation um, working with Billings Clinic um, and trying to understand how um, they were participating in a voluntary Medicare demonstration to, um, called the Bundled, Bundled Payment for Care Improvement Initiative. Um, which, you know, is basically meant to try to improve um, improve coordination of services by kind of, you know, using a financial policy lever, basically saying that instead of paying you piecemeal on a fee-for-service system, we're going to give you a bundled payment and try to, you know, kind of improve coordination um, that way. Um, and they were using RC in that context. Um, and then through my work there, I became kind of more involved in some of the other RC work that they were doing. Um, and it actually, I think, as I was sort of skimming through the um, the review paper today, I was thinking about the fact that I think it actually dovetails really nicely into thinking about like the work that Billings was doing, and I'm sure many other learning systems are doing, and other folks that are interested, you know, applying RC work in the field are doing, is like you know, th sort of thinking about RC as a as a dynamic model of change rather than kind of a static um, assessment of where things are, which I think was maybe where it started. So anyway, um, and since being in grad school, I've taken kind of a different turn and I'm working, I work for a company called Apt Associates now, which is a, um, basically we are a consultant to federal and state clients um, doing a lot of policy and program evaluation and implementation. So it's kind of a little bit of a different world, but anyway. Um, I guess I can jump into the review paper if that would be helpful. Okay, so what I thought I could do, given the audience, is I can just, I'll skip the background and framing because I assume you guys are all very familiar with relational coordination. Um, and I can just kind of talk through our methods um, and some of the, you know, kind of things that we faced. And then I, what I love about, or what I, and again, this is like me being nerdy about this paper that I spent a long time working on, is the, um, there was a lot of things that really aligned, like a lot of the findings that we found really aligned with what we expected based on the theory. But then there was also a lot of really interesting uh, unexpected findings, which we kind of tried to dig into. Um, and so I thought what I could do is just kind of talk through those and highlight some of those. And I think, you know, because I think that's where there is kind of meaty interest for, you um, for future research and things like that. So, um, so let me just pull up my notes on the RC paper. So what we had done, as I said at the outset, this started as something that um, Jody and I started working on in probably 2013, um, as trying to kind of put all of the empirical research assessing um, the relationship with, between RC and various, you know, kind of theorized predictors and outcomes in a single place. Um, and over the course of the, you know, the years that we were working on it, it kind of evolved. And, and part of that was also just because the, um, the, the work just started, there just kept being more and more work. Um, and so basically what we did was, you know, we used, um, Prisma guidelines to do a systematic review of all of the studies that were, um, you know, that we found related to relational coordination. 
Um, and one of the things that we we used uh, Google Scholar only because it was really important to us to not just include. We wanted to include uh, dissertations and um, things like that so that we could get at. Um, we found like there's a bias in some of the peer reviewed literature to not include null findings or findings that are kind of unexpected sometimes go unreported. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we included those. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. I, you know, I think that they are. That was sort of we felt like it was a good, um, well-founded uh, method for doing this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, and so I think the other thing for you know, if we were thinking about this was we really wanted to make sure that we were include. You know, like I come from a healthcare world. I think there's like a bulk of research that's. That in on RC that has come out of the healthcare world, but there's also a lot that's been applied to other industries um, and wanting to make sure that we did include the breadth of industries that it's been included that it's been that things have been published in. Um, and so we and then the other thing was that again, we really were thinking about this as a a way to I think what happened as we were working on it was it went from let's, you know, combine all the or like find us you know a review of all the literature that's been then related to RC um, to how can we use that to advance the theory or sort of you know identify future directions for research um, and we therefore really wanted to kind of um, think about the finding level and rather than the study level if that makes sense so that if they were kind of testing multiple hypotheses we were reporting out findings that each of those hypotheses, which made it kind of even feel more big and cumbersome than it was, <laughs> even when it was just studies. Um, but I think a few things I wanted to highlight. I think overall, um, and if you've you know had a chance to read it, I'm curious what others think are kind of the most relevant things. But I think you know, so we looked at basically we put sort of put it into two buckets. Like, what is the what does the the research say about the relationship between what um, RC and what the theory suggests are the predictors of relational coordination, things like organizational structures, shared protocols, shared information systems, um, training for teamwork, those kinds of things, and then in RC, and then the outcomes of RC. So, and we bucketed those into like quality, efficiency, worker outcomes, and then what we call learning and innovation. Um, and I think, you know, overall, and there's actually a nice table in the uh, in the paper that like puts this all together but um you know if i had to summarize it it's that like probably 80 percent of those findings that we found uh, were consistent with the theory but that there was kind of some trends within the ones that weren't consistent um and as i said i mean i think that was for me what we really wanted what i really wanted to explore here was like so what which ones weren't consistent all the time and what can we, you know, what might that say about um, what we're, what we're learning and what we're studying about the, about the theory. Um, so, for instance, I think when we looked at the, I think the p paper starts with the predictors. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we consistently found is that, um, so, often the or sort of what I guess what we theorized was you know that the, again that these findings would be like 75 percent or 85 percent of the studies the findings would be pretty consistent with what we expected to find but where it didn't work was often where um, relationships were more dynamic the task work was more complex um, and you know maybe there was some other factors at play that made that more difficult so like I know the one that I found really one of the ones that I found really interesting was around boundary spanners um, and I guess this again comes from like my own background in healthcare having done a lot of work on like care coordination I think we've all seen a gazillion um, you know care coordination models where people feel like if they can just like layer a care coordinator on top of an existing clinical process everything's going to go more smoothly but it doesn't those people don't off, like sometimes don't get integrated into the actual workflows or they're just like another person to share information with um and so that boundary spanner piece was you know that was one where um the theory kind of predicted that 
organizations where they do have a boundary spanner role, they would have higher relational coordination. Um, and we did find that there was some unexpected outcomes um, and that the boundary spanners didn't always predict um, higher relational coordination. Um, and again, I think one of the things that we suggested is it has maybe has to do with um, how integrated the care team is that they're being implemented into. Like, um, I think, you know, we tended to find that they worked, that the studies that were on inpatient settings, those care coordinators maybe worked a little bit better. I know there was a big study that one of my colleagues from Heller did around primary care where it didn't actually work. And then the other piece that we found was that sometimes like, it had to do with how that, um, how they were measuring RC and that people may then, it may wind up that people just end up having higher relational coordination with the with the boundary span of the care coordinator role, but not with each other. They just end up winding, you know, relying on that care coordinator to do that coordinating work. Um, I think another piece that I found really, another one where we had some kind of interesting, um, interesting unexpected findings had to do with shared information systems and maybe this isn't as novel as it was when in 2013 when we were sort of starting this off and I thought you know I think everybody thought that like integrated EHRs were going to save like <laughs> solve all of our information sharing problems um, and there was a lot of people you know and it was but it was it was sort of that same idea that you know from a you know and again this is my healthcare bias but like when people had a shared information setting um opportunity they either sometimes just relied on that to share you know they didn't like to share information and therefore like it reduced other forms of co coordination or communication um or it had to do with like the quality of information that they were actually putting in those ehrs um and that that wasn't actually actionable valuable timely you know sort of if you think about the scale of the the um, the domains around communication and that it wasn't timely and it wasn't accurate. You know, it might have been like twelve hours later they were just like updating their notes and that doesn't actually help in a in a critical time sensitive situation. Um, so I think one of the things that we kind of came away from all so all of the the research around you know sort of all looking at across all of the things the research around the predictors of RC. I think one of the theories that we had is that you know, it may actually be a more dynamic process. Like there may be need to be higher levels of RC pre-existing in order to, um, in order for those types of structures to actually be well implemented and sort of implemented as they're designed. Um, and so I think, you know, that raises some, for me that raises some interesting questions about future research and sort of thinking about like, is it maybe it's like a chicken and an egg thing, right? Like if you have like a, a highly integrated team that, and, I, and then I guess, sorry, I should, I'm thinking and talking at the same time, time but um, I think that, that there's that, like is there some kind of baseline of RC that needs to be in place in order for there to be, um, for these systems to be well implemented? And then there's another piece, which is are there particular um, team structures and work environments for which this matters more? than it might in other settings. Um, you know, back to that question around some of the studies that were done in inpatient settings found that boundary spanner role really Im improved how they were working together. Whereas in the outpatient setting, it didn't maybe didn't matter as much. And maybe that's because the team is bigger and the task is less inter the tasks are less interdependent than when you're dealing with like a complex inpatient care situation. Um, that's just my like personal theory, but <laughs> um, so I think those are sort of the, those are some of the big takeaways. I think when we we as I said at the beginning, we we split this into predictors of RC and outcomes of RC, and the four big buckets of outcomes were quality, efficiency, um, workers, and then learning and innovation. Um, and I think. I'm remembering that, you know, the quality outcomes were pretty consistent over, across the board. There were some that were a little bit less consistent than others, um, but that generally speaking, you know, especially thinking about from a healthcare perspective, there were studies that, you know, RC was um, was associated with all sorts of, of patient quality issues. Um, and then from a, you know, the efficiency was, was a bit more mixed. Um, 
And um, but and then the worker outcomes were largely very positive. So we saw things like, um, you know, decreased burnout, decreased uh, higher retention, you know, reporting kind of stronger relationships with your coworkers, which I think all of which is probably um, kind of understandable and makes sense that, you know, that those that like those outcomes would be the the most affected because, and then maybe those, some of those other outcomes stem from people being more engaged and kind of feeling more supported at work and all of those kinds of things. Um, I think the other one where it was, so the other one was learning and innovation and what, you know, it started to think about when at the time we were, there was a couple of studies that had come out try, like assessing the relationship between RC and psychological safety. Um, and um, I think that's an interesting area of, again, where, you know, it, I think where one of our takeaways was, it, you know, it may be, that's another place where, like, the temp, the, the order of things may, you know, maybe, you may never be able to understand it, but that, you know, in an environment with high RC, they're more likely to have psychological safety, there's more likely to be kind of a learning environment. Um, and maybe you need to have that before you can, you know, kind of, that maybe that supports RC, maybe it's the other way around. Um, so those were some of the most more kind of, I think, nuanced and interesting takeaways from from that um, review. I think the other thing, you know, we identified a few areas for um, future research. Um, and I think, you know, a couple of them which probably resonate even more now than um, than did when we were writing that set, that article was about, you know, thinking about um, how, because I think at the time this research had just started and I don't know for off the top of my head how much it has evolved, but um, when you have a, um, how does RC, what's the impact of RC and like how does it look when you're having, when you have a diverse workforce or people, you know, both sort of demographically or people from different um, educational or kind of clinical backgrounds, you know, sort of how do different people of different types of people work together. Um, there have been a few studies that came out when we included them in the review, but I imagine that's a, an area ripe for additional understanding. And then I think, you know, we were thinking a lot about, as I said, this sort of maybe this isn't, you know, how does all of this inf inform thinking about RC as a mechanism, you know, as, as kind of a dynamic model, uh, for change rather than just a like kind of a static assessment of like where an organization is. So I guess I'll pause there and see if there's questions or anything anybody wants to talk through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, agree. I agree. I have a paper the, the other day about, about female, female physician, physician experience. experience. Um, uh, and lateral lateral. Lateral. Comment. I can't remember when I was on Twitter. I mean, the whole thing. Like, um, the fact that so on page 20, you, you guys haven't here, female physicians experience significantly lower levels of relation coordination from their colleagues and male physicians. Uh, yeah, I don't even, I, like, oh my gosh. We need to measure, we need to include gender. I never think of that. I know, and uh, like, so few studies that I have been a part of have included gender or race in those, you know, in the survey, in how we've, like, analyzed the survey data. Um, I had one question because, so Heidi, I see, is on the call, and she and I are doing some relational coordination work with care coordination teams in the VA, and we're laughing because um, we don't even know how to, I, people won't even help us identify who's on a team to send them the survey, and so what I hear you saying, and tell me if I'm hearing this right, is, like, there's probably no baseline relational coordination with these groups. This is sort of a new boundary spanner rule. So the reason we're struggling so hard is we can sort of make the assumption there's none. Mm -hmm. If they can't identify who's on their team. Or, and, I mean, Heidi, I'll let you speak up, but it sounds like they aren't even willing because they're afraid it'll, uh, Heidi, why is that? Yeah, part of it, I mean, honestly, I'm making a lot of assumptions. I don't know if it's because you know, they're nervous, like maybe they think that this survey is going to, you know, that we're judging them based upon like the results of what the survey will come up, or they don't want to add to somebody else's workload, um, you know, because at one point they were like, well, how long is the survey? And so I don't know if it's like 
if that's what they're worried about or if they truly don't know like who they're working with. Like at one point I was just, I asked them, I'm like, just tell me the people that you co-signed to your notes. And it was like silent. <laughs> so either they're not co-signing anybody to their notes or they are and they just didn't want to tell me. But those are just some of the, the issues that we're currently running into. Interesting. I think one of the questions that I have, like when you're running into challenges like this is, is there a way to ask a more generic version of relational coordination that's not specific to like your interaction with your work group and other work groups, but just generally within your within your environment is communicate like with your entire work team, like is communication is it timely, is it accurate? Is, like, like would that be some way to sort of get it a, a beginning version of this to help inform what do you do next? I like the idea. I'm sure that goes off license though, right? I mean, it sort of takes you oh. off the I know. <laughs> Did I mean, Aaron, did you run into that at all? So Aaron is actually um, the author of, of the, one of the very quoted papers in here. Um, so yeah, I also I also masquerade as Aaron Eberich Blakeney. So <laughs> um, um, and we did I forget if the most recent paper that we did made it into the reviewer just was published right afterwards. But um, we've looked at both before and after implementing an interprofessional rounding model with inpatient advanced heart failure care teams. And that was one paper. And then we did a subsequent paper where we looked, we did sort of a longitudinal analysis over five years and looked at um, whether or not the in initial improvements that we saw were if they were increased or maintained over time and they were. Um, we did though see some interesting things with like, um, Speaking of like different roles and basically we we did sort of a sub analysis and Heba from um, Brandeis or yeah Brandeis um, helped us sort of do an analysis to look at like did relational coordination improve in the same ways for all the different work groups and professions and it it did not like those who who don't rotate to other areas so like um, attendings who rotate on and off service fellows who rotate through different specialties, um, their relational coordination didn't in increase within or between work groups as much as it did for the nurses and the nurse practitioners and the social work, the, basically the people who are always in that area, the relational coordination got better for them and stayed better for them, which I think is an interesting sort of, as you start delving into looking perhaps by gender, um, by race, ethnicity, but like I think there is a lot to be sort of examined there. So you felt it was the rotation through and not the hierarchical the place on the ladder? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Like the we looked at it a few different ways, and um, we felt like the rotation through was in, was really key because like at least with our schedules, um, an attending might rotate through for two weeks twice a year. And so, um, <laughs> and they don't necessarily, ro they don't rotate, they sort of, it's a one after the other. So within that work group, they're seeing the person's paperwork from before them and they've seen, they've had a little bit of a conversation, but they're not, they're not like a team that is working together all the time. Um, and then for the, I think the hierarchy is something that I would like to explore further. Um, what we did see is that basically that there was more room to go up for the nurses um, because they started from a lower, their RC scores started lower and went higher. And some of the RC for like the residents and the fellows started pretty high and then went a bit lower, but never still was higher in a lot of cases. I haven't looked at this in a while, but like still is often higher than that of others. Well, and I think that connects with what we found in the Dartmouth paper was that the RC was sort of like I always I think it felt like it and it's not it's it's logical when you've been in a clinical environment where like the the doctor is like the head of the 
you know, he's like the, he or she's the top, you know, so like everything's organized around their work. So like they may report that everything, yeah, everybody communicates with them in a timely, you know, <laughs> timely manner. Um, but that other folks don't feel like that information, you know, that it's like a two, two way, that relationship doesn't hold in a two way manner. Um, which I think is an interesting, you know, I'd probably to your point, it probably has to do with hierarchy. I think the point about them, you know, being in and out is also, um, yeah, it's also really interesting. I mean, it's also very valid. And I think one of the ones that things that I remember Jody being very excited about is that it did actually, we did see improvements in how other work groups rated the physicians, um, because oftentimes like that, that is an area where, um, like changes happen and it doesn't necessarily improve how how the nurses and pharmacists and social workers rate physician their relational coordination with physician groups and we did see those all go up um so that was that was useful but yeah sorry i put in a pithy uh, <laughs> I got out of an interview recently and he he like he was funny. He acknowledged it. He's like, I'm sure they don't feel the same way, but my opinion, everything's great. I tell them to do it and they do it. And you're like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that works. So can you walk through the 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 um the Dartmouth paper a little bit? Because I thought that was like a classic. Yeah, I think that that's a great way to describe that one. I feel like, um, you know, I think it was a very sort of straightforward, um, straightforward assessment. And I have to say, I'm, um, I haven't thought about it as much in the last few years as some of the other ones. Um, so I'm a little spotty on some of the details, but I think, you know, that, you know, it was, and I, the other piece was that I was only involved in the analysis. So I felt like I don't have the sort of the contextual information as much, but, um, they were doing, um, RC surveys in outpatient and, um, you know, sort of their outpatient practices and sort of their, you know, in their surgical clinics. I think it was across nine in, um, in Dartmouth. Um, and again, this is a place where I think we had that same finding of um, the RC scores, like physicians rated their RC scores very high, um, but other providers within the team didn't necessarily feel the same way. Um, and um, I think, you know, we also um, found that the the scores around um, um, staff well-being um, were... Um, were highest, which again, I think, you know, speaks to that kind of um, the back to like the the review, I think that, you know, sort of that idea that like where there is strong relationship, there's strong job satisfaction, there's strong work engagement, those kinds of outcomes are probably the first to um, uh, the first to go up. Um, and then um, it did also, we did also find a relationship between their patient experience scores and their RC, even in those outpatient clinics, um, which is an interesting, I think, an interesting finding and something that, you know, it was interesting to be doing that along, working on that analysis alongside of what we were doing the review paper, because I think we had this kind of like working hypothesis, as I was saying earlier, that there may be settings in which maybe RC and outpatient settings is just different because people are you know, it's less acute, it's less time sensitive, things are moving a little slower. Um, and so to find, you know, so it was interesting to find that, um, to find that in that, in that Dartmouth study. Sorry, um, Carolyn, in all of your reading on this, have you ever seen studies where the, the, like the patient was actually included in the relational coordination survey? Yes. Um, sorry. And this is where, like, I don't know how many, if you guys have talked to Jody much, but Jody has like an encyclopedia, like she, her brain, her ability to just be like, oh yeah, so-and-so did that study in 2016. Um, but there are, there are some studies that have done that. Um, and that there are some studies that have looked at, you know, they think of it as like relational co- 
like basically they've included the patients as part or caregivers as part of the part of the survey. Um, and I think sometimes they've even called it like relational co-creation or co-production. So um, there are definitely studies out there and I can, I think even some of the ones that we included in the review have that. Because um, in an earlier version of the review, we were also trying to look at if we could make any conclusions based or sort of hypotheses based on who was included in the survey, um, you know, patient, whether patients were included or not. Um, so I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I can try to find it and follow up with you after. So Erin, you're going to ask those guys at Jody and Hub about it? Yeah, I have. I literally have a meeting right after this with Jody and Heba about <laughs> asking. Jody would probably be faster than me. <laughs> and Jody had actually sent me four articles over the weekend um, that I can forward to you, Heather, um, and um, if you want to share them, that because I think one of the questions or the challenges that I see with that is how do you um, how do you ask patients and families without having, because the RC survey is so long when you do it on a work group by work group level. And so um, are there ways to do this so that it's not so burdensome for patients and families? And um, is kind of the direction that I'm trying to figure out if I can go with it, where maybe it's a, a broad question about the care team as a whole, rather than like your physicians and your nurses and your pharmacists and your social workers. So. Right. Well, this is like unrelated to my RC work, but to my current work is like, I think another challenge is, you know, patients don't always perceive all of the people that go into their, their experience, right? Um, so I think it can be hard to figure out how to ask them about it in a way that makes sense to them that, you know, and that they sort of are, understand what you're meaning without you, yeah, without biasing what they're trying to get at. I mean, it's so interesting. I was just reading some some well-being surveys before this meeting. And, you know, they do like 50 item surveys, right? Like people have the gall to do that. And I don't know what their response rate is. But, you know, it seems like almost even though the relational coordination survey is just seven items, even you have to go through multiple roles, right? So in this paper, you had what? Um, eh, wrong way. Um, one, two, three, six. So that's a 42 item survey. Yeah. And if you yeah. throw a boundary spanner in there, I think, Erin, I wonder, like, if you're doing a boundary spanner intervention, which is what we're doing in some of our VA stuff, um, do you just test RC with the boundary spanner? So, like, the, the veteran in the boundary spanner, you know, that's all we care. The physician in the boundary spanner. The boundary spanner can talk about all the relationships with them. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there because um, it's a super interesting question. Yeah, and I almost wonder, like, do you, depending on how, what you're, N is like, could you sort of ask some people about some and not ask everybody about all, which I, from an analytic perspective, probably like that puts me very much in the deep end of the pool analytically of like how you do that. But it is, it is really hard. Like we, I forget how many groups we've had and the ones that we've done, but it's, it's really long. Um, and when you're asking questions of patients, you're also usually asking them about other things like their functional health status and, and lots of other stuff. And so I'm like, I can't ask a 42 question section on relational coordination for this particular population, or at least not in the context of the study that I'm working on right now. So this sort of dovetails into Carolyn, the whole, all the work that's going on at Billings, because my first thought when I looked at the Dartmouth study was like, okay, well, they seem to be doing fine. There's some interventions we should all be paying attention to. Why are we surveying these folks? Let's just, let's, what, what's the bother? But then, you know, what Erin has talked about, she has a five-year study showing that it's it maintained it. And then this just shows the body of work that was needed to keep this going. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, what I really liked about this was um, this, I was like, you know, it wasn't just this was like a quality improvement project that, you know, and we tried to figure out how we could link it back to the literature and, and publish on it, but it wasn't necessarily like, it wasn't set out as a research study, um, you know, and I think that it took us, long, as I was saying at the beginning, like it took us a long time to get it published for that reason, because it wasn't necessarily designed as a, a research study, but I think it's, you know, for people that are in practice, um, it's actually, I mean, I think it's a really valuable thing. Um, 
but anyway, so I mean, Billings, their kind of RC journey, they started working on RC years ago. Um, and, you know, they also were very interested in complexity theory and complexity science. And um, I think that's how they came to RC. And they have, you know, sort of this, they had maybe not dissimilar to what you guys are doing. They had this like kind of book club reading group around improvement and, and, you know, they were sort of looking at different theories of change and trying to figure out how to, you know, thinking about it. And they came up, they started working on RC. Um, and that, you know, what really ended up happening was like what we summarized in that paper was like three interventions in one, uh, you know, sort of three different or two big different interventions. Um, and then we did qualitative interviews with the staff that had been involved to kind of understand from their, like what their experience was like, um, and kind of what the, yeah, what their experience was like working on the projects. And what we ended up seeing and hearing was like, there was so many, one, I think really helped kind of add some contextual like meat to a lot of those worker outcomes that we see are consistent. Um, it was like, like very explanatory in terms of like, oh, right, this is why people feel like they're more engaged and they're more empowered and they like less burnout because they have these. But it also, I think, um, was interesting to think about, like, I think some of the findings that we have in there kind of lend to this also like this dynamic thing that like, that it isn't just like a, um, it isn't a static, it isn't a static measure. And it also like, like as it increases, it may beget further improvement, you know, like it may kind of circle around back on each other, like improving RC will then also lead to, may lead to these better outcomes, which may then sort of improve the relational coordination even further. Um, but their work started in the ICU. Um, they had, so I think they had identified relational coordination as kind of a potential tool to support some of their quality improvement work. Um, and they had an IC, ICU um, leader that was very interested and uh, sort of suggested that they try it. And I think Aaron, you know, to what you were saying about the people, like the different scores at the outset, they, what they did was they identified that, you know, they were able to use the RC survey and sort of a self-assessment as like a self-assessment tool to figure out, okay, like what groups are not doing well talking to each other, what, you know, are feeling like they're well connected, what groups aren't. Um, and they found that the, the PTs and the OTs had the lowest scores because they don't, they're not like, they weren't assigned to the IC, like there wasn't a, a OT in the ICU. There's an OT department that like, you know, basically depending on patient needs in a given day or week would kind of staff people out. So obviously there's like a static group of OTs, but they weren't like regularly part of the care team. So, you know, like um, Jen might go up on Tuesday and somebody else entirely might come up on Wednesday. Um, and so they were often kind of feel like they were reporting very low RFC scores. And when they kind of talked about it, it was, you know, they were feeling kind of left out of clinical decision making. They didn't really know what was going on with the patients. They didn't understand like other people's, um, what was going, you know, like other people's decisions and things like that. So um, that wasn't, you know, they, they basically as a group, like they used it as a self-assessment tool. They did a lot of brainstorming of like, what are some, um, structural interventions they could make to improve that information sharing, what were some relational interventions. And, you know, it, some of it sounds very sort of like, I think they started having like some kind of internal competition where they would get pizza, whoever won, like the RC bingo cards, you know. Um, and then some of it was more structural in terms of like, instead, you know, having dedicated PT, PT and OTs on the ICU versus having them float all over the hospital. Um, and so then, you know, what was interesting was to see how the work in the ICU then spread to other units in the hospital. Um, so like when I was doing my dissertation, I was really focused on the orthopedics because they were participating in that bundle payment program for orthopedics joint replacement surgery. Um, and so they were specifically using RC to try to like help um, guide their carrier design strategy in response to this model. Um, and, but, you know, they took, like, some of the PTs, and obviously, like, PTs and, PTs and OTs have a big role in joint replacement surgery patients. Um, so some of the folks that had been involved in the ICU work 
kind of tried to take it over to the um, to the orthopedic work. Um, and they were able to, you know, translate that and sort of keep spreading it into different units. Um, and it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a, they have made a system, you know, hospital-wide investment in this as a, as a tool um, and as a, uh, yeah, as a tool to sort of do some, like, basically as a tool to do self-assessment and then also like engage, um, uh, I was also at that RC roundtable, Aaron, <laughs> in Billings. Um, anyway, they were using, um, you know, using it as a tool to engage staff in quality improvement activities um, and help, you know, work with staff to like for this staff to identify things. Um, I think one of the things that was a kind of a key takeaway, which maybe is not as even necessarily related to RC, was that, you know, I think a lot of the senior leadership that we interviewed for that project, and I also talked to as part of my dissertation, kept kind of thinking of it as, you know, it was almost like, like it'd be very easy for somebody to read the literature and identify some interventions that have worked in other places and just like announce that that's what they're doing. But the fact that it was, you know, they really forced themselves to like, to not do that, not have it like a top down quality improvement initiative, but have it come from the staff and the ideas can engage the staff in those decision making processes. Um, I think everybody agreed that that really um, was a, one of the keys to their success. Um, I think the other thing was that it really empowered um, the frontline staff to take ownership of the their um, like their organization and how they could engage in quality improvement initiatives. Um, you know, we were doing these interviews and it was interesting to hear these nurses and, and folks like that who are saying, you know, that they felt like they really had a much better understanding of how everybody worked together, how it all was connected. Um, and um, and um, that, you know, they were excited to have kind of to take ownership over improving the quality of care that for people that they serve, which, you know, I think from a like an org it was a great organizational outcome of all of the work that they were doing. I mean, I, I talked to some of the Billings people. I, I got engaged a lot later in this than you guys did, but like, it, it's so inspirational to think of it as like a system-wide framework. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you've met Jen Potts at Billings, um, and I don't know if she's, it's been a while since I've caught up with her, but, you know, they basically, she was one of the, o, she was an OT who was in that initial ICU group, and then um, they sort of ended up taking, you know, she was still doing some clinical work, but she kind of became like the RC ambassador for billing. So she would, you know, go around from like practice, from like group to group and help them figure out how to like use this tool and do these stuff. You know, it was very interesting to like, to think that they could do that, you know, and think about somebody sort of in, basically have an internal consultant to help people figure out how to work on their coordination. Erin, is that you at University of Washington? I don't know. Well, <laughs> not exactly, because we um, I would love for it to be, but we don't. Um, I think one of the ways that Billings has been like it has had a much more institutional level investment in this, like I think we've worked really well with the inpatient cardiology services around advanced heart failure care teams, and we've sort of branched out a little bit into a couple of other areas, but we it's not an institution-wide thing at the UW. Um, and I i think that the from a sustainability perspective, like it, I think it does help to have it be something that the whole is is a language that everybody understands as in a way of thinking about sort of how they're framing things, which is part of why I'm excited for the work that you're doing within the VA of <laughs> trying to sort of do it on a larger scale um but there are definitely usually when when somebody starts talking runs across relational coordination um eventually they end up chatting with me <laughs> so, which i am very happy to do i mean i find it funny like this is our little posse right so we have annie and we have rachel all who've taken and bridget and, and they've taken the training like you know in the va we're too big to do anything we have to spread the knowledge 
-hmm. Yeah, billing sounds quaint in compared to what the VA is. <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't know. I think like, um, yeah, be, I think having the fact that like literally the we got our HRSA grant funded that was where we had planned to use the RC survey and we'd written that and it got funded and then we discovered sort of inadvertently that the RC roundtable was happening like a month later in Billings. And so three or four of us from our group sort of were like, oh, we're, go we're going to Billings. And it really did have an impact, I think, on how we then were able to operationalize the use of the RC um, framework and seeing how others had used it was really, really helpful. Um, and it's also like, I don't know, I, I kind of fell in love with Billings while we were there. We're like, this is, this is so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I spent a good a chunk of time. I mean, I spent, I don't know, probably I was out there four or five times over the course of working on my dissertation and then sort of following up on things. And it's a, I mean, it's a, you know, it probably is, it's a smaller place. It also has that, um, there, it's a, I don't know how, like I've encountered this in other kind of more like rural communities where like there's just an attitude of like we're just going to figure this out and work together and get it done where you know because it is small enough that people can um and I think there's an element of that but it also seems like they've had tremendous support from their um their leadership and I know before they even you know got interested in RC they've always been doing kind of interesting you know they've, they've been an interesting model and have a sort of a strong organizational culture of um, kind of being open-minded and, and creative so um, I think and that. I think one of the things I remember about them is that they have a like in their system they have a chief learning officer or at least for a time they did that like having that sort of those um, community service purposes and learning purposes being sort of around the executive table, um, I think is is a really interesting model that they have um, trialed. And I don't know much about how where that is at this point, but yeah. Yeah. So Caroline, in your in your new role, I, do you use RC or do you just always see the lens that way? Um, I don't use RC very much right now. We actually are pursuing, thinking about using it on a project that we're working on. Um, but I think I just, I work on a lot of projects related to, um, I actually work on a lot of projects related to kind of coordination of services across different sectors. So I think I just kind of think about it in a more theoretical way now than that we don't actually use the RC survey very often. Although, like I said, we're actually considering it for a project that we're working on now. Um, but I do a lot of work related to kind of we do mostly policy and program evaluation. And um, like I said, mostly related to like cross sector coordination around social determinants of health and um, things like that. So it's, it's definitely, and I think thinking about, um, like, I, like thinking about the theoretical implications for some of these elements of like, like the boundary spanner role, like, does it having a care coordinator really help or does it just mean everybody, you know, like it's not enough to just have a care coordinator. Like you have to think about how are they implemented and, you know, and I think that some of that theoretical stuff comes from thinking about this RC stuff so much. Yeah. I mean, in my, in my dark days at the moment, I'm just like, you know, the VA, we have, we have funding, right. To put, so Christine Jones is on the phone. She's the PI for one of our implementation projects. And, like she has funding to put a, a care coordinator in to do this evidence-based program. And that person was identified and I don't know, maybe sort of trained and then pulled to COVID. Okay, crap. So now you got to go like, it's obvious there's no relational coordination. Um, and these institutions are like, yeah, can you come in and do this work for us? But you're like, what's the, there's so much else wrong. There's so many competing priorities. I, mean, I don't know. Anyway. No, no, totally. I mean, I think it's like one of the sites we're working with and Heidi has been through all of this. <laughs> I don't know if she's still on, but <laughs> she's been in the thick of this, but they're like, oh, we have 20% vacancy for for nurses. Like we cannot dedicate anyone to this, but it's been interesting because it feels like you have to be kind of nimble and figure out, well, where are there offsite people who cannot actually see a, a person um, in the bed? And then you can maybe have somebody. So we've had to be pretty nimble, but then it doesn't, um, you know, 
people who are offsite and who might be telehealth nurses or, you know, just working by phone, it's really hard to create relationships. Right. Well, that's something we've, I mean, and again, not specifically related to RC, but, um, you know, thinking, doing like, we've heard it a lot on other projects where they're talking about, you know, especially with the shift of everything being virtual, it's like the telephonic case management might work well for the like the patient relationship, but it can be really hard to be integrated into the care team um, when yeah. everybody, you know, when you're off site and everybody else is on site. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I look at the pizza party idea. I mean, even but the, a project we ran a couple of years ago, like we ha we paid for a nurse to go visit another nurse um, in a different state to say, like, learn what you're doing. And that really was successful. It's just so I mean, I I think it's interesting that the systematic review, you definitely saw this like speed up of science. And mm -hmm. I mean, see, because so Heidi and I are working on something right now. We're actually going to start we're going to work on a paper about adaptations because we went into this thinking this is going to be classic. I know who's on the team, do a relational map, then do the survey, and off we go. And we can't even do the map. Um, so we're going to try and figure, you know, maybe, you know, challenge that challenge people to be like, okay, well, how do you even assess relationships and communication if you don't, people don't know they're part of the team? I don't know. Yeah, no, that sounds, I mean, it sounds interesting. And I think it is one of those unanswered questions, or sort of, you know, one of those things that we identified. And, you know, I think it, as I said, we tried to, we, at some point we tried to think about, is there a way that we could look at these, um, uh, look at these studies and cut it by who do they include in the survey or like who do they ask, you know, who do they ask? Because obviously that's also a source of, could be a source of bias if they're not included, you know, like actually, and that's a great, in Billings, they did, the second time they did the ICU survey, they included the chaplains. Previously, they hadn't even thought about including the chaplains and the chaplain. Somehow it came out that the chaplains, the nurses only knew that somebody was, you know, going on to palliative care um, and, and you know, like end of life um, services because there was like this chaplain cart that got put outside the a comfort cart that got put outside the room. Um, because, you know, the family would be there and they would, you know, sort of but. So they included the chaplains in the second time, but the the fact that like nobody even thought about the chaplain, you know, like nobody even when they did their initial team map, the chaplains didn't even come up as part of the team in the ICU. So um, I don't know. It's just an interesting, it's an interesting question. More questions and answers at the moment. <laughs> I um. I want to thank you for coming. I know Bridget, you probably can tie it up for us, but we we took the full hour of your time. And any other final questions or thoughts from Annie or Rachel or? Well, one of the things I've been kind of thinking about, and we don't have time to get into this now, but um, like Caroline, something you said kind of brought this up for me. I've been thinking a lot lately about how like what we measure in and of itself can create change, and um, like the questions that we're asking make people pay attention to those things. And um, yeah, so th that was something I was thinking about along the lines of what you were talking about, but that's much bigger discussion than uh, three minutes. Well, thanks guys. This was really, it was fun. I appreciated um, getting to talk to you guys. Sounds like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, thank you. you. All right. And you can join us every month. We have we're trying to keep working through the relational analytics book. So oh, nice. Cool. <laughs> Surely. Um, well, thank you guys. Have a happy holidays, Christmas, New Year, all that good stuff. And um, we appreciate everyone taking the time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>